Well, yes, welcome to the Big Ideas Night on Suffering. And we've done a lot of Big Ideas Nights over the years on uh, theological topics like predestination or the Trinity or justification. And we've covered ethical issues like uh, euthanasia or transgender or online purity. But there hasn't been a night like this where my heart has ached during preparation. Suffering is just a big and painful topic. Uh, and we're doing it as uh, this topic, as Warwick has said, because many of us have been through it. Some of us are going through it now and we will all face it. It is very relevant. And what God's word says about suffering is so important for us to know. Like just in the last year, uh, I've been with and around people at church who have been going through all kinds of suffering unemployment, relational breakdown, a parent with dementia, infertility, cancer, death. I've been to two funerals in the last nine months. Suffering is just ever present. For me personally, I've mostly been spared long-term debilitating suffering. I think God has kindly limited the amount of hardships I've been through. I will share during this talk about three moments of suffering in my life, just to illustrate some points. Uh, but I come to you mainly as a Bible teacher and not as an expert in experience. And as Warwick said, that might well change in the future. Uh, one of my sons had a serious car accident earlier this year. Now, he was okay. Uh, the car was written off, but he was okay. But I think I know the words of James 14, 4, uh, 4, 14 are true, which you'll see on the screen there. What it says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. That will come up soon. Yep, there it is. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And that is so true. So even if you haven't suffered greatly, uh, well, now is the time to spiritually prepare for it. And it's important to say that this talk is not designed as a suitable counsel for anyone in the midst of acute suffering. So when suffering hits hard, especially grief, just straight up Bible teaching is not that helpful. What, what people need at that point is love and Christian presence and care. Uh, you'll know through the story of Job, when his friends came to him in his grief, what did they do at first? They sat with him silently for seven days. And that was probably the best thing they did. Once they started talking, everything went downhill. <laughs> a couple of years ago, a friend of mine reached out to me after a moment of grief and loss. And I came around, we went for a walk. I said nothing. I said there was no teaching, no wisdom, a little bit of reflective listening. Uh, and I prayed for my friend and that was it. But as the years passed, he spoke many times, actually thanking me for my presence just at that time, just being there, that made a difference. So if you are in the midst of acute loss and grief at the moment, it, it may just be too soon to hear Bible verses and teaching about suffering. Maybe it's time to, to just pause, pause if you're listening to the recording or the live stream, maybe in six months you would listen to it again. But for now, this talk will be big, Lots of Bible, big and stretching. Uh, you may need to go over the live stream recording again, or if you've got the verses in your booklet to look up, it will be big. And there will perhaps be a few emotions in the room as well. We may touch on painful topics. I've got a hopeless track record of predicting my emotional response as I give talks on painful topics, so I'm not sure what's gonna happen from my end. It's okay if there are tears, it's okay if there are emotions, it's nothing awkward, we're in this together, so it's all good. Uh, so uh, that being the topic as it, as it is, I might just pray again as we launch into the Bible topic. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, suffering is such a big and painful topic. Thank you that you do teach us so much in your word and help us by your spirit to understand and accept your truth. I pray for anyone in this room or anyone listening online who's suffering particularly at this time, please bring them comfort and hope. Help them see your goodness and love in the midst of pain and help me accurately teach the Bible with wisdom and sensitivity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just so you know and where we're going, we're gonna tackle this subject under several headings and they're on your outline, but just to be clear, they're on the screen now. So what kind of sufferings are there? What problems does suffering raise? What is the origin of suffering? What about God? What about Jesus? What is our hope? Why do Christians suffer? What do we do? So lots of stuff, that's where we're heading. We'll move along each one fairly quickly, uh, but that's where we're heading. So first of all, first heading, what kinds of suffering are there? Now this is important because it's easy for us to get focused on our own suffering uh, and experience 
and not realize just the extent of suffering beyond our own lives. But our experience and the Bible tells us that there are many different kinds of suffering in this world. And knowing this can help us be prepared for what might be coming and helps us with compassion and care for others. So what do we see in the Bible as to kinds of suffering? Now, I won't have supply Bible verses for all of these, some are obvious, but there's, there's definitely sickness. And under that heading, you would include physical pain, mental illness, emotional pain, and also the social consequences of sickness, such as isolation and poverty. There is the suffering of natural disaster, flood, drought, earthquakes, and so on. There is crime, such as theft and robbery, violence, sexual assault. There is war. Uh, while I was speaking with one of our mission partners just last week, sharing me about the war in his country right now and the realities of that, what that means. There is conflict and relational breakdown in our lives, including adultery and divorce. There is the worry and stress and anxiety of things. There is poverty and hunger and the humiliation that goes along with poverty. There is gossip and slander, reputational destruction. There is remorse over sin and all the guilt and anguish that go along with that. And there's persecution. The Bible sometimes talks about persecution and attributes this to testing from Satan. So Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. So persecution is one of the things. And then there is loneliness. In Psalm 88, if you ever read Psalm 88, it's one of the darkest psalms in the Bible. The psalmist concludes uh, the psalm with these words, you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my only friend. It's, it's chilling. Now this one particularly resonates with me um, about something that happened decades ago for me, but you know how it is with suffering, your memories are long. Uh, when I was only I was 16, in year nine perhaps, um, my school friend group like formally rejected me. I found a letter in my pencil case saying they didn't like me, they didn't want me to be around, they wanted me to stay away from them. And that's very painful, isn't it, for a 16 year old to receive that out of the blue. And that sent me into a kind of loneliness and sadness for probably like three years um, and has probably shaped like the person I am today. So. I've got a lot of compassion for anyone with loneliness is a big part of my story. But of course, there's more kinds of suffering. There's just the pain of having family members and people you love walk away from the faith or who don't believe. That's often shared with me as a pastor as I pray for people. Paul speaks about this in some way in Romans 9 to 11. In these chapters, he is so pained that his countrymen, the Jews, have mostly rejected Jesus. And he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So very real for Paul there. And, it, and I think this would resonate with us. And there is the heartache of childlessness and infertility, which we see in the Bible many times in the lives of Sarah and Rachel and Hannah, and, and these heartbreaking words from Proverbs 30. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough. And then of course there's grief itself, like the death of a loved one. And there are so many examples of grief in the Bible. The one that comes to mind is a Paul speaking about the sickness of Epaphroditus in Philippians, where he says, I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in the distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. And those words just stick with me, sorrow upon sorrow. That, what, that would have been Paul's experience. He had Epaphroditus died, and you're coming from someone who believes in the resurrection, but it's so real, sorrow upon sorrow. A quote I came across as I prepared this talk said this, I said, grief is a life-shaking sorrow over loss. Grief tears life to shreds. It shakes one from top to bottom. It pulls him loose. He comes apart at the seams. 
Grief is truly nothing less than a life-shattering loss. And that's true, isn't it? Grief tears life to shreds. So we race through that just to show that there are so many kinds of suffering and the Bible opens our minds and hearts to it all. And some of it will come our way, some of it we'll have to deal with. There's an, an unfortunate saying that gets thrown around sometimes in Christian circles that goes like, God only gives us what we can handle. I don't know if you've come across that. It's just not true. God gives us what we can't handle as well. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. You see it there, far beyond our ability to endure. And so often that is the experience of suffering. Human suffering, it's deep and it's wide. And in the Bible, we can recognize our own pain. We can also lift our eyes to better know the pain and sufferings of others. So we come to our second heading, which is, well, what problems does suffering raise? And for one thing, like suffering is a problem in itself. Like it's, it's painful. It's not academic. It's a problem right now. Suffering is an immediate pressing problem. But suffering also poses problems for becoming a Christian and staying a Christian. Like we know suffering can be a real barrier to people coming to faith. I'm sure we're familiar with the objections as Warwick shared before. Like you're asking me to believe that God is good, but how can God be good when there's so much suffering in the world? And perhaps when there was such suffering in my own life. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure how common this objection is in the Bible itself, but it's definitely common now. People have a lot of questions about suffering as they object to Christianity or explore Christianity. So, but also in the Bible, suffering is potentially a problem for people staying Christian. In the parable of the soils in Mark 4, when the sun came up, the plants in rocky soil withered. Jesus said this about those people. He said, others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So suffering can cause people with a shallow faith to fall away. And in Revelation 2, as we've seen, this kind of suffering uh, can be described as the work of Satan testing God's people, in trying to entice them to give them up. As it says there, they will try and test you. But it's not just persecution. Uh, it, we also find it hard when the prosperity of the wicked seems to be so much better than the, the, the state of the righteous. That causes us to doubt God and his goodness and his fairness. The people in Malachi say, where is the God of justice? We just can't understand if God is good and powerful, why is this happening to me? And Gideon feels this in Judges 6, verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? This very poignant verse, isn't it? And we do indeed get caught in the question of why. For some people, we very easily follow the pattern of thinking that suffering must be a direct result of sin. One of the kids' team members sent in a question from one of the kids, or as a hypothetical question, I'm not sure, but the question was, do I have cancer because God doesn't like me or something or something I've said or I've done? It's very close to the disciples' question in John chapter 9. Uh, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's that connection. Or Job's friends come to this idea very quickly. Even as early as Job 4, Eliphaz, one of the friends says, as I've observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. It's such a common understanding. We, we tend to think that suffering is the direct result of sin. And I was listening to this talk by Nancy Guthrie and she shared about how people often feel the connection between suffering and things in their past, such as sexual sin or even having an abortion. And people are caught thinking, is my guilt so heavy? Am I being punished for what I have done? And so suffering can impact our relationship with God. And we see that in the life of Ruth. 
in the, in, uh, sorry, not in the life of Naomi in the book of Ruth, where she says, don't call me Naomi, she told them, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi is bitter. And there's a temptation for us to think evil of God. And this is like the, the test and the situation for Job. Uh, you, would, you might know Job 1 verse 22. The chapter ends, In all this, God did not sin, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. The temptation was there for, for him to charge, to say that God was doing wrong. God is not right. God is not fair. So how we understand suffering really matters for our relationship with God. And it can damage our relationship with God. So we come to our third heading now. What is the origin of suffering? Like, where did it come from? Now, a few things here. We, we know that suffering is not an inherent part of the universe. Now, some religions or worldviews see an eternal balance of good and evil in the world, or maybe a mixture of gods with good qualities and bad qualities. Now, if that was true, then evil and suffering have always been with us and always will be. That's kind of a depressing way to look at the world. No, we know from the Bible that the world was created good. That's clear in Genesis 1. God saw that it was good, very good. But suffering entered into our world as a consequence of sin. And this is Genesis 3. We'll read verses 16 to 19. God says, To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return." So here we see pain, and that's both painful labor for the woman and painful labor for the man. And we see the conflict between the men and the women, and we see death returning to the ground. So suffering and death is the result of that original human sin and God's judgment. And the rest of the Bible looks back to this moment. Romans 5 verse 12, Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Or Romans 8, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So suffering came into the world through sin. And as we saw from that list in section one of all the different kinds, sin accounts for a lot of the suffering in this world. And I think even sickness and natural disasters would probably not be as extensive and painful if it wasn't for sin making things uh, worse. And the connection between sin and suffering is there in that original sense with Adam in the garden. But also, it's true as a general pattern, sin can lead to suffering. And this is one of the themes of the book of Proverbs. So according to Proverbs, sexual immorality leads to conflict. Laziness leads to hunger. Gossip leads to broken friendships. One of the purposes of Proverbs is to teach wisdom so that people might avoid needless suffering through foolishness. And another factor as we think about the origin of suffering is the work of Satan. So Satan afflicted Job with his sufferings. And we see this elsewhere in the Bible. For example, when Paul spoke about the thorn in his side, he says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, we don't know what that was, but you see the messenger for Satan in 2 Corinthians there. Satan is at work as well. The big question, of course, is whether our suffering at this particular moment is a direct punishment for sin. And we saw that was the disciples' question in John 9 about the blind man. But Jesus' answer is clearly no. No. That is just too simplistic to say that suffering is a direct result of sin. He makes this clear in Luke 13. It's a very important passage thinking about suffering. Luke 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, 
Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Shalom fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. So it's very clear. Jesus rules out a simplistic connection. We are all sinners, yes, but that doesn't mean those who suffer are any worse. And this is a strong denial of, of denial of karma, which is so popular in, as a way of thinking in our world. Karma puts the blame for suffering on the sufferer themselves. Karma says that the suffering is your own fault, but that is not the Christian way. Now, in a moment, we'll think more about God, but I just want to point out just that what the Bible says about the origin of suffering actually really helps us. It helps us in a lot of ways. Like to the atheist, say we, we can say, we can say two things. We can say that suffering is real and that it is not good. The atheist can't really talk about suffering. They can talk about electrons moving along nerves and bacteria multiplying and tsunamis in the ocean, but they can only describe things. They can't actually say what happens, whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. It just is. So we have a better answer than the atheist. And to people who believe that in eternal kind of good and bad is a balancing forces thing, whether that's gods or spiritual forces, no, we can say, no, this is not how the world is supposed to be. The world is created good. It's supposed to be good. Suffering is out of place. It's not natural. It's not good. And that sense we have inside that this is not right. This is not how it should be. That's absolutely correct. The Bible has so much to say that is helpful for suffering people. And in fact, suffering can be a factor in leading people to search for God. Many people's testimony includes something about suffering, causing them to think more about life and more about God and come to him. In Amos, God talks about how suffering was intended to bring people back to him. So, for example, in Amos 4 verse 6, he says, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Now, in this case, Israel did not turn back to God, but by the Holy Spirit today, we do see people turn back to God in the midst of suffering. So what about God? That's our fourth ending, and we will spend a bit of time here. What about God? How does God fit with suffering? What about his goodness and power? Does suffering mean that he's not there, or that he's not good, or that he's not powerful or not trustworthy? Let's look into how suffering fits with the doctrine of God. And we've got some subheadings here that God is sovereign, God is good, and God cares. So there's some big points here. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign over suffering. That means he is in control over the painful events in this world. He, he rules over what is happening every moment. Even the smallest events, such as the death of a small bird, Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And the psalmist can reflect in Psalm 31 about sharing his own, about sharing his sickness and enemies and loneliness. He says, my times are in your hands. Psalm 31, 15. So God is in control over what happens. But then what does that actually mean? Well, I think it's true to say that God permits suffering. That was the case with Job when God permitted Satan to afflict him. And that might also describe the thorn in Paul's flesh, that messenger of Satan. So God permits or allows suffering to occur. It is also true to say that God brings suffering more directly. And we see this in Isaiah 45. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. I was reading in Chronicles this week about Jehoram, verse 18. After this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. Quite direct there, he's affl he's, he afflicted Jehoram. Or in Psalm 119, verse 75, I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. So this is true. God brings the suffering. We do see this in the Bible. But on this, though, I think we need to be very careful about how we speak in our own circumstances. It's very hard for us to talk about suffering and God in this direct way without implying that God is evil or cruel. 
Now, it's hard to prove, but I don't think this is how we are trained to think and speak in the New Testament. So I personally would avoid saying things like, God gave me cancer or God crashed my car. It's, it's almost impossible to speak like this without becoming bitter. So we can say that, yes, yeah, God permits suffering, God brings suffering. But thirdly, God's sovereignty means that he works through suffering. That means he works through suffering to bring about his purposes. God is so powerful and so good that he can use evil and opposition to bring about his plans. We see this in Ephesians 1 verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So he works out everything. He can even use suffering to bring about his purposes. And two examples of this are the enslavement of Joseph and the death of Jesus. So in Genesis 50, Joseph reflects on the actions of his brothers and says, uh, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See there God's intention for good. And as for the death of Jesus, Peter says in Acts 2, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of sinful men, wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So in both examples, God works through evil to bring about his good purposes. So God is sovereign over evil. He permits suffering, he brings suffering, and ultimately he works through suffering. Now that again raises lots of questions, but it is ultimately good news to suffering people because the alternative is that suffering has happened out of God's control, that somehow he was distracted or overwhelmed and so it just happened. And where does that leave us? I mean, who's to say whether he will get distracted and overwhelmed again? How, how can our suffering have any meaning there? How can we have any hope there? The alternative puts the suffering person on a foundation of sand. There can be no hope or certainty there. So I think much better to believe, as the Bible says, that God is sovereign over suffering. But then the question is, how can God be good if he permits suffering? How can he be good? Well, the Bible is very clear throughout the whole Bible that God is good. Plenty of verses there. For example, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all, 1 John. And we see in the Bible not just the goodness of God, the fact of it, but just why he is good. All of his love, his kindness, his wisdom, his acts of redemption and protection and rescue, his faithfulness to promises. Again and again we see why God is good. So what then about the, the presence of evil and suffering in the world? Well, it is a, it's a natural human tendency to attribute evil to God. And that's what Adam and Eve did in the garden, didn't they, when they blamed God for the fall. Eve blamed God for creating the snake and Adam blamed God for creating Eve. But the charge never sticks. Even though God is in control over evil and suffering, <coughs> guilt and wickedness only ever attach to humanity, not God. I'll show you three examples of this. So in 2 Samuel 24, at the very end of David's life, the nation was sinning again, and this is what happened. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. Really interesting little passage. The Lord incited, influenced David to take this action of a census. But taking a census at that time was wrong. It was only a thing, a thing would do if, if God commanded it. Otherwise, it was an act of pride or military ambition or greed to do with a tax collection or something like that. But, so it was wrong. But David goes ahead and does it anyway. And then what happened after that? Well, that's in verse 10. David was conscious stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I've done a very foolish thing. So even though God incited David, it was David who sinned. It was David who is guilty. It was David who is foolish. God remains pure and good. 
A second example is in the prophecy of Habakkuk. Habakkuk's a great book about where Habakkuk complains to God about the presence of evil and suffering in Israel. And God's answer is in verse five. He says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm gonna do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. So God is influencing evil forces again, similar to inciting David, this time the raising up of a violent army, an invading army. So then Habakkuk complains that the cure is worse than the disease, that's terrible. But then God answers him to say, well, the Babylonians will themselves be punished for their sin. So in two verse eight, because you've plundered many nations, he says this to the Babylonians, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. So once again, the guilt attaches to the human agents, not the God who raised them up. And of course, the final example is the cross of Jesus, which we've seen already in Acts 2, where this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. But later on, it says, as the people reflected on this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? They felt their guilt. They were cut to the heart. God is sovereign over these events for the cross. It was his plan of foreknowledge, but the wickedness and guilt are on the people. Now, how can this work? How can this possibly be? Because if God was just a big version of ourselves, it wouldn't work. Wickedness and guilt would attach with him, attach to him. But he's not just a big version of ourselves. He is God. This is the way to think about it. Just God is so good and so powerful that he is able to rule over this world in such a way that he remains pure. And ultimately, this is a satisfying way to think. Just think about a time when you have sinned. Maybe you you lusted after someone or, or told a lie or raged with anger at someone. In some way, you contributed to the suffering of this world. Now, God may have been sovereign, or he is, he would have been sovereign over that sin and that suffering, the people, the circumstances, all the factors. But really, the guilt is ours, isn't it? The mature response is not to blame God, but to own the sin and the guilt ourselves. And then from there to go to God, who is good, holy, pure, forgiving, and seek his forgiveness and trust in him. Isn't that better than passing the blame onto God or trying to attribute evil to him. This way of thinking is not only biblical, it's also good. And so we come to point three about God and suffering, and that is to stress that God is kind. God cares and comforts us in our suffering. When we suffer, he is the one we can go to. Job says this, you gave me life and showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. And 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The testimony of the whole Bible is that God hears our prayer when we cry out to him. He answers prayer. He helps us. Psalm 86, hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. And if we are ever in doubt over his kindness and his love, the Bible directs us away from the immediate circumstances of our lives and just consider the cross. So Romans 5 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 8, we see it again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? There can never be any doubt about God's goodness, kindness and love because of the cross. And so we are sustained. I love this quote from Peter Jensen. He says, the Christian life is not one in which we avoid suffering and conflict, but one in which we are sustained through it by the Father and his great love. Now, this was true for me and my wife, Jen, during a moment of deep grief for us. 
Uh, in 2004, Jen was 20 weeks pregnant. The scan had come back fine, everything was going well. But then for no particular reason, her waters broke and within a few days, our first child was born and died on that same day, February 12. We'd gone from the excitement of new life to death and grief within a few days. And we named him Toby. And we were utterly shattered. I remember so much about those days, just vividly, like 20 years ago. I remember coming home with no more baby. I remember the exhaustion. I remember the sadness. Um, we grieved hard. Yet through it, out it all, and I think thanks to good teaching in the past, we knew and felt the kindness of God. We never doubted God's love. We knew that he gave his son for us. And there was no way that this tragedy had meant that he'd withdrawn his love. Now, Toby's remains are at a crematorium in Sydney, and this verse from Job is on the plaque. It says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And does it really express what was in our heart? Toby was a gift for a short time. God was sovereign over his leaving us. But whatever pain we felt, we wanted to bless and honour the Lord, our God, who knew us and loved us. Yeah, so that's God. That's point four. Let me take a breath. And so now we come to think about Jesus, which is great. This really is the heart of our doctrine of suffering. Because he's God in the flesh, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So there's lots to say about Jesus here. Jesus knew suffering. He was a real flesh and blood human in history who knew suffering, just like us. Isaiah 53 describes him as he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, or man of sorrows, as the ESV puts it in the song we often sing. And isn't it true? The Gospels describe him as poor and hungry and overworked and tired, and he's ridiculed and slandered. Jesus knew sadness. He wept over the death of Lazarus. He wept over the fate of Jerusalem. And we see him betrayed by his friends and arrested and tortured and crucified. Hebrews speaks about his suffering in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Or Hebrews 2, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Or Hebrews 5, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So Jesus might not have suffered in the same way as us, exactly the same ways, but he experienced a depth and a breadth of suffering across his 33 years that is comparable and, and actually greater than ours. So it's true to say we know that God himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, has experienced suffering like us. But second then, at the cross, Jesus atoned for our sin. And in fact, the sin of the world, all that sin that brought suffering into the world. And it's important to stress this because it's common for us to think that our suffering is because God is punishing us for some past sin, as if God forgave us part of our sin because of the cross, but the, the rest of it we have to sort of make up through suffering. But no, Jesus' death paid the price for all our sin. All our guilt was dealt with at the cross. I'll share just one passage for this, a, a go-to passage. If you ever have doubts about the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice, Hebrews 10, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
You know that song, Jesus paid it all? It's so true. It's true with our suffering as well. Jesus paid it all. There is nothing left for us to make up. Our suffering is not making up for past sin because all our past sin, our present sin, our future sin is dealt with at the cross. So if doubts and fears get at you, look again to the cross and find assurance there. And so having died and been raised and ascended to heaven, Jesus is now with us as our high priest. As a high priest, he knows our suffering. Revelation 2 says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. So whatever you're going through, Jesus knows about it. He knows you. He knows you deeper than you know yourself. And this is such a comfort when our sense of self gets rocked through suffering, especially grief. We don't even know who we are anymore. But Jesus knows us. And as a high priest, Jesus is with us in our suffering. That's the promise of Matthew 28. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Being alone makes suffering so much harder. But we have Jesus. Ultimately, we are never alone. And then as high priest, Jesus invites us to come to him in our suffering. He says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And we indeed come to him as our great high priest and draw near to God through him. This is Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, mis- way we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That promise of help in times of need, isn't that important? And then, of course, with this promise of mercy and grace, there's the promise of peace in Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And one of my friends shared with me recently that this verse was a great help for him. He was going through so much, yet he found comfort in the peace of God in Christ Jesus in the midst of suffering. So remember Jesus in suffering. We're going to move to point six, our sixth heading. After that, we'll take a short stretch break. But our sixth heading is looking forward now. What is our hope? What future do we look forward to? And praise God, there's pretty much hope in every page of the Bible. As we think about suffering, there's hope everywhere. But we can certainly look to the first thing of actually seeing Jesus. It's just to see Jesus and be with God. And I think in some way that should loom in our hearts larger even than the alleviation of suffering. Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Or his hope in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. There's this great hope in the Bible of being with Christ and seeing him. But of course, we also hope for the end of sin and death. And this is 1 Corinthians 15. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of, sin, sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's wonderful news. He is victorious over death. And so we hope for the end of sin and death. It's not permanent. The end of suffering is uh, in view. And so, of course, we just have that great hope of a renewed creation. We see that in Romans 8. I can see, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. 
For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There's a future here of the end of frustration, the future, the end of decay and coming freedom and glory. And then, of course, that much loved passage in Revelation 21 where John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God will himself will be with them and we be with their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. A wonderful hope, no more mourning, tears, crying or pain. But people, there is a question people ask as we think about hope and that is like what sort of hope is this if my loved ones are not with us? How could I not experience suffering in heaven? if my family members, the people I love, are not there. And we've seen Paul wrestle with this in Romans 9 to 11 as he grieved over his own people rejecting Jesus. What can we say about this? Well, a few things. Importantly, we never give up on people while there is still hope. We keep showing our loved ones the love of Christ. We keep sharing with them the good news of Jesus. As long as they are alive, there is still time. Never give up. But even so, we must trust God's word. Somehow, Revelation 21 will be true. There will be no pain, even if we can't understand that entirely. And I think that's Paul's perspective. In the end, he leaves it to God and he worships God. So he finishes Romans 11, that section about his people, just with his humility for himself and worship of God. And he just says, Oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, I'm the only Christian among my parents and siblings. And yeah, I feel this deeply as well. And this is the approach I try to take. To God be the glory trusting in his word. So we come to point seven, why do Christians suffer? Now, this, this is the question that looms large for us in the midst of suffering or people around us. And we've thought back to that list before, you know, all those different things, why is that? And we've seen that it's, there's not this simplistic, direct connection with, with uh, sin as Jesus has taught. So why, why would do God do such a thing? And especially why, why when the suffering seems to take away something good, or harm the work of the gospel, or, or connect to things that don't glorify God at all. Why? And this is actually part of the process of grieving, finding sense, some sort of meaning in, in suffering. That's important in managing grief. I read that even in a, a, a non-Christian counselor, finding some sense of meaning in grief is important. So why? Well, we've got several subpoints here. First of all, like we, a lot of the time we just don't know. We don't know and we will perhaps never know. So Job never knew the backstory behind his suffering. That was never revealed to him. And the Bible often speaks about the limitations of our knowledge. It says now we know in part, 1 Corinthians 13. Now maybe some ideas or answers in the future might come to us, but then again, perhaps not. And it, it is when we need to turn to our doctrine of God and trust in his goodness and kindness. An old friend of mine lost her first child in the womb and she shared that for a long time she wanted to know from God why this had happened. And she thought about how that might be her first question to God when she went to heaven. Why? But after a while, she came to realize that she didn't want that to be her posture towards God. Um, she didn't want to be in the position of someone demanding something from God. And so instead, over time, she somehow found contentment in him. And whether she had an answer to that or not, she was okay. She trusted in his goodness. It was okay not to know why. So that will often be the case. 
we won't know. But then, without going into specific events, in sort of general terms, the Bible actually does have a lot to say about why God allows us to suffer. And that's the next four subpoints. So suffering is one way that people become more open to Jesus. Now, we saw that with the verse from Amos about suffering and turning back to God. But I think also the Beatitudes from Matthew 5, you remember those? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, those who are comforted, than those who are meek. Suffering takes away our pride. Suffering takes away our self-sufficiency. Suffering can open up our hearts to the gospel. And you might think of people you know who have gone through a trial or some kind of suffering, and then just for a while they want to learn more about God at that point. So the, we do want to be around with these people, with these people, and share them with them the hope of the gospel. But a point three, a particular reason why Christians suffer is that suffering enhances our fellowship with Christ. Or we could say that suffering even brings us closer to Jesus. Now, we see this in a few places. A bit of a tricky one, but it's worth seeing. Romans 8 says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. See that connection? And in Peter uh, what, chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And Philippians 1, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for him. So in each of these verses, we suffer for Jesus or share or participate in his sufferings. And in each case, it's an honor and a prelude to sharing in his glory. And this is a hard one to grasp, but somehow to suffer is to be close to Jesus. Our purpose in life should not be to escape suffering, because if that happened, we would miss out on fellowship with Jesus. And in fact, churches that teach that our life on earth should be about victory and prosperity and health and success are actually robbing people of deeper communion with Christ. So better to share in his sufferings. We suffer in fellowship with Jesus. And then the next one for why Christians suffer, and this is a big one, that God allows us to suffer so that we might grow in maturity. Now, this is such a big theme. We only touched on a few verses, but we grow. So Jesus describes us as branches connected to him, the true vine, in John 15. And he says, the Father prunes us like branches. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. So it's a vivid image. God is taking from the branches, trimming them, cutting them, pruning them in order that they might bear more fruit. It produces fruitfulness in the long term. A similar, another image, according to Peter, suffering is like the fire that gets rid of impurities in us, uh, just like metal. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to, have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. So suffering can often get rid of sin or pride or prayerlessness in our lives. In, in Hebrews, suffering is described as God's fatherly discipline to train us and grow us. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children is, are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters of all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So lots going on there. Suffering is training us, maturing us. And I think this is true. When, when I think of the mature, steady, grounded people here around me at church, the people who are real adults in their faith, well, a big part of their story is usually endurance through suffering. Pretty much that's what you see. 
Those kind of people have got deep character. And that, that comes out of Romans 5 verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And 2 Corinthians, suffering teaches greater dependence on God. Indeed, we felt we received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Suffering leads to greater dependence on God. It builds up the character. Suffering changes us radically. There's an illustration that C.S. Lewis uses that I always remember. It's quite striking. He says, um, uh, we, like, we become Christians and then we think that like, Jesus is going to make a few changes in our lives. A bit like when you, you get a house and you, you touch things up. You put on some fresh paint and an updated kitchen, maybe some down lights in the living room. There's a little touch up like that. But instead, God comes in and starts knocking down walls. God makes radical changes. Whole rooms are collapsed and rebuilt. An extra story goes on. So the change God works in us is painful. It may not have been what we had in mind, but it's bigger in scope and better. And so somehow we reach a point of seeing goodness in suffering or rejoicing in suffering, or as Romans says, glory in our sufferings. So the psalmist in Psalm 119 can even say, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. And James 1 says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And this has got to be one of the strangest kind of parts of the Bible. Goodness. Joy, glory, how can that be? And this is not about being happy because of the trial, but somehow finding joy in the midst of the trials because of the loving care of the Father who sustains us and grows us. Now, it's hard for me to reflect on examples of this. I don't think I'm great at rejoicing during suffering, not great at all, really, but perhaps I think thinking through the trials of COVID for me, that it hits home. I don't know, don't know what it was like for you, but during COVID, I like, honestly, I nearly had a, a breakdown. Um, it was a combination of the isolation, the decision fatigue, um, exhaustion, fear about losing my job or losing everything, uh, death, family, the work. So like, it all built up and I was pretty much at the point of breakdown. But over that, um, well, for, yeah, it felt like two years really, there was a kind of kind of joy, I think, just of knowing that God was sustaining me and changing me. And during that COVID period, that near breakdown kind of thing, I just confronted lots of stuff about myself, lots of my fears, my anxieties. uh, And I, I sort of grew through it, I think. I'm definitely a changed person because of that. So perhaps in for me, there was a bit of rejoicing uh, in COVID. But I just love what Paul says as he reflects as a mature Christian, Uh, He says, I I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content and in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And that's really where suffering is supposed to take us. Contentment, doing all things through Christ. So God allows us to suffer that we might grow. And the next reason we suffer is that for the sake of others, that we might be compassionate and helpful to others. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. I want you to notice how our suffering helps us serve others. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. And if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces a new patient endurance of the same struggles we have. And this is so true, isn't it? The people who comfort well have often suffered greatly themselves. And I think I've seen myself shaped by suffering. Uh, since our son Toby died 20 years ago, I think I've been more sensitive to other people's pain. I cry more easily. And I, I hope that I'm of greater help to others. God has shaped me in that way. 
And then another reason for suffering, this builds a lot of what we covered, but that is that we might become more like Christ. It says in Romans 8, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So all things here includes the suffering we go through in life. And God works through all things for good. And what is that good? That is to be conformed to the image of his son, to grow and change to become more like Jesus. And this is a good work from God who gave himself, he himself gave his own son for us. He will graciously give us all things according to verse 33. But yes, in this work verse, he does work all things for our good. And of course, then finally, the ultimate purpose, I think, is the glory of God. Paul concludes Romans with these words. He says, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. And it is right and good that God be glorified in all things, including suffering. So even though we might never know why we have suffered in this exact way in this time, there is heaps in the Bible for why we suffer. What purpose does suffering serve? And that does not change the fact that suffering is suffering. Suffering is still suffering. It is still painful. It breaks us. It shatters us. All that is still true. But there is meaning. So finally, what what do we do? What do we do if we are suffering or caring for suffering people? Well, if we're suffering, we should pray. In James it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And Psalm 142, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him, before him I tell all my trouble. So we pray, we pour out our heart to God, we confess our weaknesses. And of course, sometimes suffering is so intense, we are not able to pray. Uh, This was the case for me, I think for the first two weeks after Toby died, I I just, just couldn't pray. The mouth wouldn't operate. And at those moments, I just asked visitors to pray and I sort of prayed along with them. And of course, there's the encouragement from Romans that the Spirit helps us pray uh, in wordless groans, interceding us through our, in our weakness. So we pray. So we pray, but we also suffer together. And suffering is very personal, but in the Christian community, we suffer together. 1 Corinthians says, talking about the church body, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. We grieve with each other. We help each other as well. Galatians 6, carry each other's burdens and this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. And it's so true. In the most intense suffering, what matters most is gentleness, being present, practical care. The time for more help, for more kind of stuff will come. But it's suffering together. And we still look out for the lost in all the suffering and around us. Remember the attitude of Jesus, his compassion, verse 36 of Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Those people around us are suffering and we want to care for them and care about their relationship with God as well. John Piper says, Christians care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. So we look out for the suffering of others. Well, it's time to wrap up and you've seen how much we've covered with this night. It feels like we're just dancing around some of the many passages on suffering. I want to finish just to stress that this is not an intellectual issue. It's not a problem solving event. This is just so real for us, whether it's right now or into the future. It's not about getting our doctrine right. It's about knowing and trusting God and loving each other. Uh, 1 Corinthians says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We want to be building each other up in love. And the Bible has so much to say. We might never get a precise answer on why, but the Bible takes us beyond these questions to a deepening knowledge of the love of God and a deeper appreciation of his plan to conform us to the image of Jesus. So I do recommend going over those passages again. I recommend the resources on your outline but this is a lifelong journey. We need to keep learning more about suffering in every decade of our life. And of course, prayer. 
uh, which we will do now. So let's finish this long talk then by praying to God. Heavenly Father, we come before you weak and helpless, shattered by grief and loss, struggling deeply in our suffering. And our hearts also break over the suffering around us. Thank you for your word. You have not left us helpless, but have given us everything we need. Thank you for your son, Jesus, whom you gave up for us that we might live and be reconciled to you. Thank you that he knows us, he is with us, and he draws us near to you to find grace and mercy in our time of need. And thank you that your spirit is with us and intercedes in our prayers. Help us to trust you deeply and even somehow to rejoice in trials, knowing that they are within your sovereign rule. They are there to help us grow and you care. Help us to love and serve others. Help us to look outward to the harassed and helpless people around us. And please bring us safely home to a future without sickness or mourning or tears or death. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.